The Acolyte, Episode 4. <laughs> Let the mocking begin. Do you all know the problem with relying on useful idiots to push your agenda? You're relying on idiots. These people are stupid. Bless their hearts. A quick overview of the alleged plot. It's so thin, I'm not even going to bother with imagery. Osha, Master Soul, and his team are sent out by the Jedi Order to bring in May. They determine that May is going to go after the Jedi Wookiee, so they race to get to the Wookiee first. The whole time, Osha and Master Soul's young female Padawan make googly eyes at each other. The only thing of note we learn through this whole sequence, Osha is getting her Jedi powers back. Sure enough, May and her buddy from the apothecary shop in episode 2 are playing this side, looking for the Wookiee. The only thing of importance we learn in this whole sequence, if May doesn't kill a Jedi without a weapon, her master will kill her. May ties up Apothecary Buddy, tells him, now that she knows Osha's alive, that changes everything. She's going to turn herself into the Jedi, help them hunt down her master. May and Master Soul's team arrive at the Wookiee's hideout at the exact same time. May discovers the Wookiee's dead. Dun, 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 dun. Lordy, who could have ever done it? It's not like we saw this coming a mile away. Osha ominously says, my master's here. A menacing figure lowers slowly to the ground. They approach Osha. They pull out their lightsaber. Ooh, red. Force push everyone away. Fade to black. I was so disgusted with episode three, I left out two points I meant to talk about. I'm going to insert them here before we get into episode four's idiocy. At the beginning of episode three, we have the scene where the twins walk into the fortress for the first time. It's where they get their spice creams. If you look, you'll see dirt and weeds everywhere, in cracks and crevices, and on the stairs. This makes sense. We are told that the witches fled here. They found the fortress, so they're making use of something that was already there. There is an implication it was a ruin that they've adapted to their own uses. However, in that ascension ceremony scene, the symbolism of that ascension ceremony and having eight-year-old girls being involved, it still creeps me out. <laughs> but in the ascension ceremony scene, if you look, not a speck of dirt, dust, grass, anywhere in that courtyard. But Randy, this ceremony is very important to the witches. Of course they would have cleaned the courtyard. Okay, how do we know that? It's sloppy, inattention to detail. From a designer's perspective, it's an unforgivable mistake because it could have been fixed with just one line of dialogue. One of the witches run up to one of the mothers and say, we're ready to go. We even clean the courtyard. The second point of episode three, the power of one, the power of two, the power of many. They're trying to set up a relationship between Anakin and the twins, claiming the twins are more powerful, more important than Anakin. These idiots haven't thought this through. In Leslie Headland's headlong rush to destroy George Lucas's story, in her glee, enthusiasm, and spite, She's sending a message I'm pretty sure she doesn't want to send. Again, the problem with dealing with idiots. Leslie, between you and me, are you really trying to tell us that it takes two women to replace one man? Because I'm pretty sure that's not the message you think you're sending. <laughs> Back to episode four is bull****. I'm going to start with the little thing, but it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. It's so annoying, it jerks me out of believability. I've never served in the military, but I grew up running the hills of the Ozarks. I was taught woodcraft by a couple of old timers who learned their skills on the battlefields of World War II and Korea. And the number one thing that my brother and I had pounded into our brains, if you're moving through potentially hostile territory, spread out. The Acolyte portrays the Jedi Order as space cops, a quasi-military organization that sends out teams to track down, capture, possibly kill, dangerous criminals. 
Master Soul and his team have been sent out to hunt down a Jedi killer. The Jedi want to capture Mei because they want to get to her master, a dark side user, potentially a Sith. You know, the rule of two, bad juju. So what does Master Soul and his team do once they get to the planet where the Wookiee's supposed to be? The planet where they're expecting to run into the Jedi killer? As they move through the jungle, they bunch up, stay a nice little clump. When the Jedi get to the Wookiee's hideout, they know May is hiding inside. What do they do? They line up shoulder to shoulder. What do they think this is? The Battle of Gettysburg? Fix lightsabers! Charge! What's the result of these Jedi's brilliant strategy? One force push by the Sith, and the entire team is wiped out. It's almost like there's a really good reason to spread out. One last point on this particular topic. When the Jedi see the Sith pull her red lightsaber, yes, it's a woman, they all charge towards her all willy-nilly. They act like a mob of individuals instead of a coordinated, well-trained, disciplined team. These riders have no clue when it comes to fights, battles, strategy, or tactics. Master Rowe. Everybody's talking about how bad the acting is from Leslie Headland's wife. Yeah, I've seen more charisma from a 2 by 4 Everything that comes out of Master Rowe's mouth is either evil, stupid, or both. The only reason why the scene where the Jedi have their human resources meeting occurs is so Master Ro can cut Master Soul off at the knees, a woman putting a man in this place, because we all know how Disney feels about men. Otherwise, the scene makes absolutely no sense. First, Master Ro implies that Master Soul just might be the evil Sith who's been training May. In the very next breath, she tells Master Soul he can go hunt down that Sith only if he takes Osha, the twin sister of the assassin, she just accused Master Soul of training. You figure it out. Now we get to the evil. Master Soul wants to tell the Jedi Council all about this incident. Master Rose says, no, 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 we don't do that. If we tell the Jedi Council, they'll have to tell the Senate. That might cause us problems. We need to keep this in-house, cover this up. Master Roe has never once shown any interest in the truth or justice. From the very moment she learned that there was a Force user killing Jedi, she was willing to frame an innocent person to cover up the entire incident. And all of this so she wouldn't have to face personal responsibility. I'm going to repeat that. The wife of Leslie Headland former personal assistant to Harvey Weinstein, is advocating framing an innocent person to cover up wrongdoing, all in an effort to avoid accountability. It is true. You only can write what you know. Whoa, Leslie, you might want to slow down there. Sounds like you're making a confession. Has anybody bothered to look in Leslie Headland's basement lately? Now's the part where I'm going to talk a little design. Emphasis on little because there's not a whole lot to talk about this episode. One of the great things about Star Wars has always been its ship design. They're so evocative, they stimulate the imagination. They tell a story in of themselves. The Acolyte? Not so much. The word that comes to mind? Generic. May ship? It's fine for what it is, vaguely inspired by a P-38 Lightning fighter from World War II but it tells us nothing about May, who she is, what she's about. The ship doesn't tell us how it facilitates what she's doing. In short, the ship has no meaning. It's just a plot device to move characters from one point to the next in the story. And of course, we can't forget merchandising. Master Soul Ship has appeared in three episodes so far. And again, it's fine for what it is, it's meant to evoke memories of the Millennium Falcon. It fails, and spectacularly. The Millennium Falcon is a character in of itself. It's also a manifestation of Han Solo's personality, a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants, make-it-up-as-you-go type of guy. 
It's jury rigged and ad hoc, but when the chips are down, it always comes through for you. Master Soul Ship, on the other hand, tells us nothing about his character, his personality. It's generic, bland, sterile, soulless. Let's look at the space where the Jedi hold their HR meeting. This space is meant to evoke memories of A New Hope, the scene where rebel leaders watch the Battle of Yavin, complete with a round table and transparent screens with glowing green lines. Disney would rather rot in hell before they give us Luke Skywalker doing anything heroic. But they're trying to rely on our memories of Luke doing something heroic to give this scene gravitas. Slimy hypocrites. This scene fails to capture gravitas because they make the same mistake that they've been making over and over throughout the series. They screw up lighting. The scene in The New Hope works so well because the lighting focuses your attention. It creates drama and suspense. Tension builds as the light shifts and changes as the story unfolds. In the Jedi's HR space, there's nothing to focus your attention. The lighting's too even. It makes the space seem flat, bland, generic, sterile. Kind of like the whole series. You keep hearing me repeat that word over and over again. It's sterile, soulless. If you're going to trash the bad and you want to be honest, you have to acknowledge the good. I love the training space in the Jedi Temple. Most architects stay away from round rooms. They're very hard to do well. But if you do it right, they can become magical. This is the only space that they've showed in the entire series so far that I would actually want to be in. One of the difficulties, as well as power, of designing a circular room is all the focus is aimed towards the center. This space reinforces that by having seating around the edges aimed in at the center. And then they go and confuse things by drawing your attention out to those massive panoramic windows overlooking Coruscant. They came so close to getting it right. As a designer, I get all itchy. I want to put something over those windows, louvers or screens, that will allow in all that wonderful natural light, but will reassert the focus back inwards, remove the built-in contradiction. Now let's talk about that Sith helmet. Why is the Sith wearing a helmet? Randy, the Sith needs to hide their identity, duh. Okay, why the helmet? Why not a scarf, a cloak, a hood, a mask? I ask again the question, why a helmet? Obviously, I'm asking a rhetorical question. The Acolyte Sith is meant to evoke memories of Darth Vader. The writers of the show are trying to steal the menace, threat, danger, gravitas of Darth Vader without actually having to put the work in themselves. In the original series, Darth Vader is one of the main baddies, wore a masked helmet. In the sequels, Disney being creatively bankrupt made one of their main baddies, Kylo Ren, wear a masked helmet. So naturally, the Acolyte has to have their main baddie wear a masked helmet. At this point, we're dealing with a derivative of a derivative. Why did Darth Vader wear a helmet in the first place? Well, one is part of his life support system, keeping him alive. The other, it was symbolic. Darth Vader's helmet was inspired by World War II German helmets and medieval samurai helmets, just to name two of its influences. But it's greater than the sum of its parts. It's its own unique thing. The helmet's design was meant to tap into our primordial fears. It represents pure evil. When Darth Vader chokes to death the rebel ship captain just because he can, it confirms what we already knew. This dude is bad news. What does the Acolyte Sis helmet tell us about her personality? Yes, it's a woman. What does it symbolize? I'll tell you all exactly what it symbolizes. Jack... It looks like somebody was asked to draw Darth Vader's helmet from memory after a two-week bender. All snarkiness aside, I'll tell you all exactly what it looks like. Somebody just spray-painted a Formula One racing helmet. 
Disney is creatively bankrupt, and a bunch of cheapskates. Where did the $180 million go? This thing isn't frightening or intimidating in the least. From a design perspective, it's a joke. I understand why some people are starting to call this clown Smilo Rim. That's the highlight or low light of the episode. And I didn't even get into the really dumb stuff. Like May, how she spent all this time hunting down and killing two Jedi. And while she's looking for the third one to shank them, she suddenly decides she's going to turn herself into the Jedi, help them hunt down their master. No, I'm not messing with y'all. That really happened. <laughs> Remember, I'm on record predicting the Sith is going to be the twins' white devil mother. After watching this episode, that's still my story, and I'm still sticking to it. Let's see if Leslie Headland and her happy little band of writers are as predictable as I think. By the way, has anybody bothered to look in Leslie Headland's basement lately? At any rate, I hope I've given you all something to think about. And until next time, you all be safe. If you all are still here, get your head checked. Seriously, though, I really appreciate it. While you're at it, why don't you like this video, subscribe to the channel, click that notification bell. You can hear me yammer on about something else next time. And feel free to share this video far and wide. Please like and subscribe. Please leave a comment.